Hello and welcome everyone and a very good morning to you. And uh, let me bring in our panellists first and introduce them, uh, starting with uh, Greta Faremo, United Nations Under Secretary General for the United Nations Office for Project Services. Jamaluddin Ibrahim, Managing Director, President and CEO of uh, Malaysia's uh, Axiata Group. John Rice, Vice Chairman at GE, and George Yeo, former uh, Singapore Trade and Foreign Minister and uh, currently Chairman of Kerry Logistics, a Hong Kong listed company. Let's get straight into it. And John, uh, let me start with you. You're probably best placed to offer a view on the regional economy here in ASEAN. How optimistic are you about the future? And what are the risks for growth and the outlook? You know, we're very optimistic. Uh, we've been in the, in the region for almost 100 years. Uh, we've seen ASEAN develop in the, last, in the last 50. And we see an important trading block. Uh, you know, these economies have grown on average about 5% over the last 15 years. And that's through the global financial crisis. Uh, our business here has grown in some years at double-digit rates. It's one of our largest regions. And there are important interdependencies. Uh, you know, we've got 9,000 employees. We, we have activities in, in every country. And a lot of what we do in those countries gets exported to other countries. So this, this idea of a, of a trading block, we think, is very important for the region and for companies like GE. And Jamal, if I can turn to you, collectively, as a combined block, as a combined entity, collectively, ASEAN is a formidable economic power. Just give us some colour, if you can, on intra-ASEAN demand. If you're referring to the telecom industry, in, uh, just general economic? Generally, economically, yeah. and in your industry as well. Yeah. Obviously, you know, uh, we, what we have seen in the, in the in general economy is pretty obvious, and all of you know the a lot of intra Asia, ASEAN uh, dependencies and economic activities. Um, maybe I could stress a bit more on the ICT area. That has been uh, an area that has been growing for sure by every country, and you can see that there, there are uh, different kind of uh, trends going on here. Um, the of course, ICT industry itself is kind of, there are many components, but let me focus on the three components. The, if you look at mobile industry, where I mean itself, uh, that is, has been growing very fast, but it's plateauing. And in fact, in some countries, it's negative or flat growth, whereas the broadband uh, uh, growth has been growing double digit and still growing very fast. And uh, the new one, of course, the digital economics uh, is growing rapidly in triple digit growth and all that. And in terms of intra-ASEAN, I would say uh, is right now, as we, as we speak, at least in the, uh, is quite limited. And I think this is a subject for our discussion perhaps today and maybe in, the, in this whole event to see how ASEAN uh, working together can catalyze this movement of the digital economics. And George, if I can uh, bring you in and talk about economic integration and where we are in the process. Because one of the challenges of closer harmonization and integration is that ASEAN is a very diverse family, isn't it? You have countries like Singapore on one end of the spectrum, you have Philippines and Indonesia somewhat in the middle, and then you have the rising new Asian tigers like Cambodia. How do we mesh them all together? And what are the challenges involved there? You know, it was not very long ago that Cambodia was ripped apart because of external forces. Mm -hmm. This was a tragic, tormented land. And Cambodia joined ASEAN less than 20 years ago. The developments since have been dramatic. And there's a sense of hopefulness. And all that is possible only because there is peace. We peace the Mekong instead of being a dividing line between two worlds. It's now connecting the countries of mainland Southeast Asia. And uh, roads, railroads, optical fibers, ports, airports, all being developed, improving year by year. I'm doing trucking from China to Singapore through more and more bypasses. And there's a sense of hopefulness throughout Southeast Asia. The key is a realistic view of what regional integration can achieve. We cannot be like Europe. 
we are diverse, we will always, we'll always remain diverse, we are in between China and India. We must be friendly to everybody and be a completely neutral platform so that all the major powers, all the major economies have a vested interest in our well-being. Then we will prosper. I just want to pick up what you said there. Uh, we cannot be like Europe, and in a way there are many challenges and there are many lessons that we can learn from uh, Europe. And let me bring in uh, Greta on that note. When you consider uh, the very real challenges and the existential crisis almost that uh, the European Union is facing over its future integrity, what are the lessons from there that we can take away and apply here as we move closer towards integration? I think uh, hearing my fellow panelists talk about the opportunities, it's also about inclusion. It's about leaving no one behind. Uh, so uh, both uh, the connection with uh, the citizens and how we uh, help build jobs is important. And uh, being the executive director of UNOPS, we have been successfully implementing projects also working with the private sector, ensuring those social dimensions and uh, not to answer your question directly, I think it's all about actually making sure uh, that inclusion and the social dimensions are taken care of. And how far should we go in terms of integration? Do we need to go as far as the European Union model? Do we need to seek a formal union? Do we even have to consider a single currency at some point on the horizon? John, can I bring you in? On sure. That? Look, I, I, I want to pick up on both the point George made and Greta. I, I think this notion of having borders become points of connection instead of barriers is really impo important. Because if you think about sustainable economic growth, and to, the, to Greta's point, having everybody's boat lifted with the rising tide, you've got to make these points of connection. Whether you have to go all the way to a European Union and a common currency, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think so, but I think that's to be determined. If you can make these borders become points of connection, and do it in a way that lets everybody benefit, which is not, it's a lot easier to say than it is to do, then I think you, you, can, you, can, you can exist with a trading block and not necessarily a, the European Union model. And can I ask you to follow up on that? I mean, from a harmonization point of view, from a businessman's perspective, what do you want to see being achieved? What do you want to see in real terms and material terms being done to increase the ease of business and to potentially at some point down the line uh, improve uh, inclusivity? I'd say two things. A, a level playing field in terms of free flow of, of capital uh, and goods and capital means human capital in addition to financial capital. And then I think countries have to, have to concentrate on the, on the frictional points, you know, that the things that, that are kind of under the surface in terms of getting permits and approvals and moving, as George would know from Carry Logistics, moving goods from one place to the next and making that as easy as possible because those frictional costs, you know, are really insidious when it comes to the, the, the cost of trade. Would you agree with that, George? Do the supply chains are well established here, but they need to be smoother, yes? And the infrastructure deficit and the infrastructure gap in this part of the world is something of a stumbling block. Well, there, there are problems everywhere, and we face problems every day. But day by day, month by month, there are improvements. And uh, China's One Belt, One Road is an enormous opportunity for all of Southeast Asia. There's a chance now that in the next 10, 20 years, the infrastructural base of ASEAN will improve beyond recognition, both within ASEAN and between ASEAN and its neighbours. There is a chance now, as the blood vessels grow, as the blood flows, that many countries in Southeast Asia, in one generation, can make it to near first world status. This is a historic opportunity. And because China is here in a big way, so the Japanese feel a sense of friendly rivalry, the Indians too, and others, all competing to help us. And if we are skillful enough to maintain this foreign policy, 
then everyone will want to be our friend, everyone will have a vested interest in seeing us do well. And internally, we must make sure that we solve problems day by day, they cannot be solved overnight, that we help each other, that we do not allow uh, the natural tensions between neighbours to get out of hand. ASEAN is soft. We don't take decisions by voting. If you have to vote, there's already a rupture. So there's a sense that, look, well, if you cannot solve the problem today, let's hold back. If you can't join in now, exclude yourself, but come in when you're ready. And without ASEAN, Myanmar could not have achieved this peaceful transition. And it's an enormous achievement because even five years ago, no one could have envisaged that this peaceful transition could have taken place. And Greta, if I can give you the final word before we move on to uh, our next uh, theme, which will be uh, trade and uh, opening up market access, etc. Inclusive growth, we hear this time and time again. It's become something of a buzzword. How do we get beyond the sound bite? How do we make it a material? Uh, I can only mention that uh, we in UNOPS has uh, taken the initiative to working more with the private sector uh, and making sure that we also leverage our cooperation with governments. Uh, when we talk about social housing, for instance, green energy, there may be projects that are not as bankable as they should be, so investors say no. Perhaps we can bring that soft component to the table, have governments take a first loss risk, or actually bringing more investors together, and turn the no to a yes. And people in uh, uh, fragile situations may benefit from solutions, where they access green energy, where they access social housing. So actually finding new ways of working together with the private sector uh, I think is really important to achieve the Agenda 2030 so or really 2025 as the ASEAN countries have uh, So it's really about uh, redefining and refining the private-public partnership. Can you give us a sense of where it is working? Is, is there a blueprint? Is there a model where it's working in this region that can be applied or scaled up elsewhere? Uh, it would not be for me to say what works and not work, but I think is what is really important uh, is to develop these new tools where the investors, whether they are private or public, put their money together and make them work at a larger scale uh, compared to what is done today. All right. Thank you for that, Greta. Uh, Giorgio, let me get back to you. ASEAN is where the growth is. That much is sure. But short to medium term, how concerned are you about the rising tide of protectionism? Not within ASEAN itself, because uh, we are a collection of kingdoms and principalities. It's never been a one empire, historically. Uh, we are, the Malays have a beautiful term for this in Bahasa, Tana di bawa angin. We are the lands below the winds. Half the year, the winds blow one way, half the year, the other way. And it brings in influences from, from China, from India. And the result is very mixed cultures throughout Southeast Asia. And we are connected by the waterways, which was the original internet. So there's no way in the world that we can be seriously protectionistic in ASEAN. We cannot survive by being protectionistic. It's not in our blood. Jamal, would you agree with that? And are we fairly well insulated in this region since a fair few of our economies are not uh, cyclically open? They have very strong demand drivers internally. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, we, are, we would be very concerned if there's uh, a lot of protectionism or nationalism. Uh, in our industry, it's a highly regulated industry. You know, every country has their own rules and so on and so forth. What we can or we cannot do as a foreign company we, we, of course, we are a Malaysian-based company. We operate in 10 countries, and five of the ASEAN countries are where we are operating in. So it, it is a concern. For, for example, in some countries, it's one or two countries, we can't even operate uh, our tower business, for example, to build infrastructure. We are not allowed to unless we, uh, with some exceptions, we can't, basically. And 
in terms of uh, being able, uh, there, there's, uh, in some of the countries we operate in, I, I won't mention which, which one or the other, there's a huge uh, biasness of uh, nationalistic support for the local company to the uh, detriment of us as a foreign-based company in some of the countries we operate in. And it's obviously it's something that we have... Where would you say that, that is most acute or most pronounced? Where is the biggest uh, problem? I, well, I can mention some countries like Indonesia uh, and so on, but it makes it difficult for us to operate if there's a huge biasness for the, uh, their own national company. Because we, although we are a foreign-based company, we contribute significantly to the economy directly and indirectly. And we, we are advocating uh, the concept of um, um, the, the digital leapfrog, digital revolution that can tremendously affect the whole ASEAN to the tune of about uh, you know, incremental of one trillion GDP increment by 2026. And to do that, the, uh, that protectionism has to be, uh, we have to be on a level playing field, as John mentioned, uh, from one company to another, from one uh, country to another. So that is to us one of the potentially biggest, a big, a big problem to achieve that. So the country to country uh, barriers need to come down. The yeah. playing field needs to be uh, leveled, to borrow right. uh, John's uh, expression. Do you think that you are winning that debate? At this juncture, in some countries, yes. In some countries, not quite. It's a long way to go. But there's scope for compromise. There's scope for compromise. OK. Uh, we were talking about the pivot to China earlier. And John, you and I were talking about this earlier as well. The US seems to be disengaging from this region. It's walked away from TPP, and nature abhors a vacuum. Does China fill the void? And is the pivot towards China something that we can work with, or do we need a more diversified approach to trade? Look, look I, think, I think China has a long-term strategy which, which you know, demonstrates that it wants to take advantage of successful economic growth in this region and beyond, and the One Belt, One Road strategy is a perfect example of that. You know, we, see, we don't see it as a threat, we see it as an opportunity. We, we, do a, we do a lot in China, and we can work with our Chinese partners in just about every country along the Belt and Road. So, so we have to adjust, we have to pivot. You know, in the beginning, if you go back 30 years, we were in China to, to, to buy things, to export, and to, and to sell into that market for domestic consumption or domestic use. In today's world, you do everything. You're in China for China. You're in China for the rest of the world. You're participating with Chinese partners along the Belt and Road. And it's the way it will work in the 21st century. So, so we have to be you know, bilateral almost everywhere. We're in 180 countries. Uh, we like to take advantage and participate with, in multilateral trade agreements because we think the, the level, level playing field works for everybody, but if, if that's not going to be the case, then we go door to door and we, and we figure it out because, because that's, that's the world we live in. It may not be our choice, but it's our, it's our reality. If we do see increasing government to government deals, then isn't that necessarily crowding out the private sector? Is that something that you're concerned about? I'm sorry. The if we do see more government to government deals being done, isn't that necessarily crowding out the private sector and you guys? I don't think so. I mean, that's one of the reasons we've built a footprint in 180 countries so that we can adjust. Uh, we don't like to see tariffs and trade barriers because we, th we think it constipates the system, right? Uh, but but if, if, if it's required for us, I mean, when we're in Indonesia, Indonesia wants us to be a U.S. company, a global company, and a local company at the same time. And we're equipped to do that. And we've been building that footprint for decades. And so we're going to, we, we hope to be agile enough to adjust. Uh, because at the end of the day, the world needs electric, <laughs> go back to my point before, right? You can't have sustainable, inclusive growth if you don't have electricity, right? It's all bets are off. So you got to, if you're working on that stuff, you're going to be welcome everywhere. 